Uh, I'm with photographer Coleman Rogers in his home office. And we're going to talk about his photography career and his current work. But where I'd like to start is uh, at the beginning. Where, where were you born and raised and uh, you know, how were you educated? Uh, so I grew up just outside of Detroit in uh, Gross Point, Michigan, um, right on a lake, uh, Lake St. Clair. It kind of joins Lake Huron and Lake Erie. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on the water. Um, <clears throat> one summer, I think I was 14 or 15, I visited some cousins in Colorado and um, they were into film, uh, shooting and, and developing film and printing. And I thought that was a really amazing thing to do. Uh, so when I went home, uh, I asked my dad if I could start using this camera, which uh, uh, he bought on their honeymoon in Paris in 1950. Um, so this was my first camera. Um, in high school, uh, I shot some with this that was just for fun. Um, and at some point, uh, my dad bought... Um, a 35 millimeter camera for me, a Minolta SRT 102. And um, I did some photography for the school newspaper and for the yearbook. Um, so I was hooked on photography at that point. Um, finished high school, um, I went to college at Brown University in Providence uh, where I studied mechanical engineering. I didn't pursue a, like an artistic career for um, uh, in, in the university. Um, but I was always around artists and creative people. Um, about halfway through uh, being in school, uh, I changed courses a little bit um, to focus more on music. Uh, music is something I'd always enjoyed. I sang in, in middle school and in high school. I was in some musicals. Um, so I started uh, messing around with synthesizers and uh, doing some um, abstract composition for music in college. And um, when I graduated, instead of using my mechanical engineering degree, um, I went into the music industry and uh, was a recording engineer for a long, long time, working in studios, uh, recording engineer, and then a service technician, installing recording studios, repairing equipment, that kind of thing. How many years did you do that? Let's see, recording, um, I finished school in 1984. Uh, I started right away in a studio in Brighton, right near St. Elizabeth's Hospital. It was a basement studio called Splice of Life. <laughs> kind of a funny name. Um, so I was uh, I started there in 84, and um, I think the last actual recording project I did was probably, I would guess, in the mid-2000s somewhere. Um, the technology really changed going from a tape-based um, medium to uh, went from analog tape to uh, video cassette based digital recordings and then from there to digital workstations. Um, and as the technology got less expensive, I was doing less and less recording work and I started uh, doing more and more technical work, installing studios. Um, so I really did that from, let's say 1990 all the way through uh, 2014. So there is an intersection between that uh, part of your life and photography now because you do a lot of event and promotional photography for performers. I do. Um, you know, I, I did live sound for a long time and I really like the live music environment. Um, but for a long time when I was uh, just buried in, in recording studios, I was, um, I was away from that. And between uh, family life and, and working in studios, I didn't really get out to see uh, live music that much. So somewhere around 2008 or 2010, um, I went, was able to start going to shows again. And I took a camera with me at one point, uh, this guy, which is um, when you're standing in a crowd in front of a band with this guy, <laughs> it, it'll break some elbows. People bump into it and it's like really bumping into something that hurts. Um, but I shot a couple of rolls of film uh, of a friend's band with this camera and um, they came out really nicely. I enjoyed it. Uh, I showed them the photos. One of the photos actually ended up on their album cover at one point. Um, and I was pretty much hooked from there on shooting live music. 
Um, I shot a few shows in the next year from there, I think, with that camera. Um, but shooting live music on film uh, is really expensive and time consuming. Um, you have to shoot the film, of course, at the show, and then you have to process the film, and then you've got to scan the film or print the pictures and then figure out what to do with it. Um, digital cameras, for me, around even 2010 and 2012, uh, were okay, but uh, they really didn't capture what I was trying to capture. Um, but I used them anyway, because you have to use the tools you have, you know, make do with what you have. Um, in 2014, um, I was in a bike accident where I got run over by a school bus. And part of my rehab, um, I was on crutches, uh, and a small club opened around the corner from here called the Last Safe and Deposit Company. It had been here in Lowell years ago, um, but uh, pretty coincident with me getting run over, uh, they opened. And so I would take a camera and go over to the back door and someone would help me get down the back steps into the club and I would take photos. As long as I could stand there and take photos, I would shoot photos. And then I would come home and edit the photos from there. Um, I got out of the house a lot <laughs> doing that. Um, going through the rehab process for the first six months, uh, it was nice to kind of have something to do that wasn't physical therapy or watching television. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, back to shooting live. Yep. Uh, when you shoot live, um, we talked earlier about the, some of the difficult lighting situations. So when you shoot live, you shoot digital. I do. I do now, yes. Uh, and the cameras have come a long way in the last 10 years uh, as far as the resolution of the camera, uh, the noise floor, being able to shoot in the dark. Um, the, one of the challenges is was always how high can I turn the ISO before you really start losing the kind of quality of black in the images. And of course with a lot of images that I shoot live, there's quite a bit of black. Um, so if, if an image like this didn't have good noise characteristics, these areas really wouldn't be black. They would be kind of gray and grainy, um, which might be effective, but not really appealing all the time, you know. Your approach to framing a, a, a shot when you're when you're shooting live a live performance that, that we talked about earlier that I thought was kind of interesting because you're a, it's a composition technique that you that you use fairly consistently and, and the results seem to be pretty good. You know, um, I like being right on if I can be and the musicians are comfortable. I like right being as close as I can uh, to the action. Um, it helps me feel the energy and that I'm trying to capture. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't really preview, like maybe it's post view. As I'm shooting, I don't look at what I've shot. I might, maybe in a 40 minute set, I might check twice just to see whether things are going okay. But while I'm shooting, I focus on the music and what's happening in front of me. Um, because I shoot all prime lenses, I can't just slide the barrel in and out and zoom in on something or zoom out on something. So part of, uh, part of my process is I focus really hard on what's going on on the stage. I look for interactions that are happening on stage. I try and see what might be about to happen and then make sure I've got a lens on that will allow me to capture what that is in a good way. Um, and I try and fill the frame with an expression with energy, uh, with relationships between people, um, you know, whether it's uh, one individual and people in the background or people actually interacting with each other, you know, on the stage. I try and, and as much as I can, fill the frame with, with that action. And then if I need to crop further, you know, you can see on this particular image that I did crop it down a little bit to fill the frame even more than I had originally when I captured it. Your, uh, your accident, did, has it affected your, uh, your outlook on photography or your, your, uh, the, the way you deal with photography, the way you deal with subjects? Yeah, um, it has a few facets to it. Um, because I've shot photos since I was 16, it's a real comfort zone for me. So um, 
<laughs> Boy, I'm starting to get emotional here. Um, when I have other things going on in my life from PTSD or physical issues, I can go to a show if I can get past the anxiety of getting out of the house. If I go to a show, I can really lose myself in the energy and what's happening. And it, it's, a, it's a relief to me uh, because it's something I've done since I was a kid. It's kind of like that uh, cocoon of, of losing yourself. Um, I don't have to talk with anybody. I don't have to think about anything. I just concentrate on, on the action and energy in front of me and try and capture that as, as uh, wonderfully as possible. Um, so that part of it, uh, I don't know whether that's an upside, a different side of it is because of what happened, um, I have a lot of physical limitations. Um, I have an issue with my left knee that crops up from time to time. And to move around and, and pay attention and be right on top of some of these things, I've got to be very mobile and sometimes I have to drop to my knees to really get the angle and the per conf, uh, composition that I want to get. Um, to really get it so you see this one isn't a perfect example but I've got some where people really interlock with each other and it almost looks like it was crafted that way you know and it's me waiting for something to happen and 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 uh, the timing of getting the composition just right and part of that is being in the right place um, so I run into physical limitations with uh, pain and issues with my knee that that distract me a little bit from that um, but <laughs> I end up giving up my body sometimes, <laughs> you know. I had a long talk with my knee doctor two weeks ago about this. <laughs> you know, I, I have to be more careful, you know, or else I'm going to end up needing surgery. <laughs> when you're on stage like that, uh, um, how aware are you, or do how aware do you need to be of an audience that's also trying to see the performance? Um, uh, I've done it for a long time with... Um, in the back of my mind has always been the audience is not there to see me they're there to see the band and I shouldn't be in the way so I wear black when I'm shooting like a stagehand so I don't I try not to distract as you know try and be as little distraction as possible um, but I also try and move around a lot so that I'm not just couched in front of somebody the whole set and by moving around uh, and if I'm in an environment where people in the audience know me a lot of times if I'm trying to get into a spot, they know that I'm gonna get into a spot and move away again, so they'll make room for me to get out front and shoot some photos and then get back out of there. Um, so it's it's nice being part of a community here in Boston that enough people know who I am that, you know, when I wanna get in front of the stage, they'll let me in. So let's turn a little bit to uh, workflow. Uh, you do mostly shoot uh, film, although you, you do use digital when you do the entertainment pho photography. Mm -hmm. You do most, mostly shoot film, I black, do. And, black and white. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, you develop it yourself. I do, yep. And I think your workflow is kind of interesting because of um, because of where you take it in the end, digital. You yeah. really take it digital in the end. So, could you explain how that works? Sure. Um, so, you know, there, there are kind of two tacks if I'm doing some fine art photography. Um, there are two tacks. One, I might have uh, a project in mind, um, something I want to try and experiment, uh, something very specific about what I'm seeing in my head that I want to end up with a final image. Um, it, I have something I could show. It'd take me a little while to find it, but I could, I could look for a couple of images that are an example of me seeing something in my head and then taking a month or two to really fine tune getting there and then finally ending up with what I saw in my head. Um, and so it'll be taking a certain camera. Uh, I've got quite a few different film cameras from different vintages. Um, this is an early uh, 1900s Icoflex uh, icon that uh, come on that folds out. This takes beautiful photos, but there's no coating on the lens and won't take filters or anything. You have to be very careful with this one. Um, and then there's the the Icoflex, that's the twin lens reflex. Um, this one, it has a beautiful center of the image, but kind of around the outside, it's really a beautiful blur and kind of halo around things. So it has a very different eye than the Icoflex, uh, than the Icon. And then there's something like this uh, Mamiya. This is really like a professional studio camera. 
So this takes very sharp, very uh, high detailed resolution images. So depending on what I see in my head, I'll choose one of these cameras and go out in the field and shoot off a couple of rolls of film. Uh, this camera gets 10 shots on a roll of 120 format. Uh, this one gets 11. And then, you know, even things like this Holga, um, the old plastic camera, um, this gets 12 shots on a roll of 120 format. So um, I'll come back with hopefully even numbers of film shot off, film rolls shot off. Uh, my tank holds two rolls. So um, I can put two like rolls of film in the tank. Um, depending on what I think I've got in the, in the, on the film for images and what I'm seeing in my head, I'll choose a different developer or a different uh, development style. Sometimes high agitation, sometimes I'll do uh, more stand development where the uh, chemical sits with the film for a long period of time and it kind of lowers the contrast uh, on the image. From there, uh, once the film is developed, hangs dry, and I cut it up into pieces, and then I've got two different scanners uh, that I can use to scan the, the film into the digital domain. Um, and then once I've got the images in there, I do it at some fairly low resolution so I can see what I have, and if there's an image I really want to work with, I'll go back and scan that image at very high resolution and bring it into my digital workflow. So I'll shoot it as a TIFF, and then bring it into Lightroom, and I can do the standard Lightroom kind of darkroom modifications to it of uh, contrast and exposure. I can do some dodging and spotting and that kind of thing inside of Lightroom. Um, but I can also then bring it into another program I use called Aurora that really allows me to adjust the dynamic range and the grain and the contrast. I call it micro contrast in that in that program, um, and it's. It takes the film from, you know, looking a certain way and I kind of enhance sometimes the film look, uh, bring out dynamic range that is in the film, but you can't really see it on first scanning. So uh, that's my work. And then from uh, having uh, modified the image, once I have an image I really like on the screen, um, I've got a Canon Pro printer that I can print up to 17 by 22. And it's a really high quality kind of archival uh, print. Another interesting thing about your uh, approach is that you are kind of a camera agnostic. You really don't, you, you really don't favor one brand over another and it's really, the choice of camera for you is really based on what you're trying to accomplish. It is, it is, because each one has its own character. You know, you can't quite force a, one camera to do something else. You know, I've tried to, to shoot landscapes with this guy and it just doesn't look right you know this is really for shooting a face or you're you're have something in mind not too far away from you that you want to feature and that's wonder this camera is wonderful for that whereas the uh, the Mamiya is a great landscape camera because it's sharp corner to corner and really does a good job of capturing everything how many cameras do you have in the rotation <laughs> I think uh, I only have one digital camera, uh, but as far as film cameras, I've probably got about 12 or 15. So I know people who have a lot more than that, uh, but I try not to have any duplicates. I haven't bought a camera in a long time because I haven't felt the need. I kind of cover so many different personalities with the different cameras that I, I think I've got everything covered I want to cover. Uh, do you have any projects now in progress? Um, aside from uh, being pretty far behind in editing uh, live music, sets of live music performance, um, I don't have any real artwork projects that uh, I've got in mind right now uh, for new work. Um, I've got uh, a project for a building that's under construction. Um, the, uh, there's an artist who's consulting with the developer to have artwork on the different eight, eight different floors of the building and I'm going back and choosing some work that's going to be appropriate for that. So that's that's a current project for me right now. You uh, do you exhibit any at any other galleries in the area other than uh, Arts League of Lowell? Uh, I do uh, show work at the Copley Society. Uh, I'm an artist member there. 
uh, I think they call me a copley artist because I've got I've been there a long time and I've won some of their awards and, and various things so I got myself up to being a copley artist um, I show work there uh, I have shown work here in Lowell at the brush uh, when Uncharted was open I've shown it to Whistler House um, and it's been a long time but uh, there were years where I was a member at various art associations around the Boston area. Uh, Concord Art Association, Newton Art Association, Rockport Art Association. Um, it was a lot of driving, carrying artwork to a show and then going afterwards and picking it up if it hadn't sold. So you spend uh, some of your time in uh, Portugal now. You have, uh, you have a gallery of your own in Portugal. Yep, Margarita and I bought a space that's uh, not too far from where we live there. Um, and uh, it's right on the beach, you know, in between a couple of restaurants. So we have some traffic coming in from people walking by. Um, and uh, it's nice having a place where if I feel like doing an experiment, and printing it out and putting it up, I pretty much get immediate reaction from people that are right around me. You know, I don't have to wait to uh, to find out or wait to put it in a show. I could just put it up on the wall and see what people think. How much time do you spend in Portugal each year? Uh, right now, we go back and forth uh, about half time. You know, um, I think our goal originally was maybe three or four months here, three or four months there. Uh, COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench in that where the last three years we've been in Portugal pretty much full time. Uh, we came back, it's now uh, February, uh, we came back just last October, this trip, and we'll be here until May. Um, so that's six months here, six or seven months here this time. You are a co-op member at the Arts League of Lowell. I am, yep. You're also on the marketing committee. I am, yep. And I just want to remind everybody that the Arts League of Lowell is at 307 Market Street in Lowell, Massachusetts. So you can come and see Coleman's work there. Also, he has a website, and uh, I'll put the link to the website in the video. Great. Uh, in the video description. Uh, I, I looked at your website, and I, I got a kick out of the fine art page, because it says, <laughs> and I quote, I will need some time to figure out how to present my work here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my fine art page, what I, what I realized after I started posting fine artwork was that um, I had friends who said, oh, I've been to your website and I love your work. You don't mind if I took a couple of your photos for my screensaver, do you? So I kind of stopped putting fine artwork up on my website. <laughs> the, the live music work I post, I don't mind if people take that. It's got my watermark. I'm happy for bands to use my my uh, my live photos as much as they want. I ask them to credit me and leave my watermark in the image. But the fine artwork, I I I want people to come to a gallery and see it, you know. So I haven't modified that page yet to, just just to go to say that. But I, I guess that's amusing. But I just, I'm going to figure out what to do. <laughs> Sounds like you haven't figured out. Anyway, uh, you need to go to his website to see his uh, his work in the uh, entertainment, uh, photographic rock bands, mostly rock bands, yes? Yeah, I, you know, um, I like seeing music where the uh, performers are really into what they're doing. Uh, energetic, um, expressive. I like perf uh, shooting photos at smaller intimate clubs as opposed to being at, uh, you know, a big concert venue. Um, I like shooting bands that haven't made it yet you know, or on their way up because they're usually they're more appreciative. They need the help more. Um, and uh, it's kind of where my heart is. You know, when I was a, a, a studio technician, I worked a lot in small studios. You know, it just felt more comfortable for me. Hey, Fred. And everybody's probably seen Freddie. If they've seen me in the gallery at any time, they've probably seen Freddie. Hi, little dude. <laughs> Well, Coleman, thank you very much for the interview. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot about uh, processing uh, film, which I never would have thought of uh, that particular path for film, you know, shooting the film and then going digital. Yep. Um, especially if you have a good scanner. It's, it makes a big difference. Yeah. It sure makes a big difference. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk offline to you or anybody about, uh, I don't, I'm not like an evangelist about it, but I, I really do like it. I think it's, it's a, uh, I end up being very hyper, you know, you can tell the way I talk that I, 
things go really quickly. When I'm shooting film, when I'm processing film, for me, everything slows down. <laughs> and it's, I think that's really healthy for me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Coleman. Thank you, Ed.